I'm Alison Tandry of Spirituality 101. I will be reading an abridged audiobook adaptation of Trom 2023, the latest revision of the resolution of the Mind a Games Manual by Dennis Stevens, a book about how the mind is structured, how life is a game, and how one can come to understand life and resolve their mind through the theory and practice of Trom therapy. The following is best used as a companion to the book and not a substitute for it though it can be completely understood by itself. The TROM exercises will be explained but the exact commands are only to be found in the TROM manual. I'll be reading mostly directly from the manual, with my comments, clarifications and word definitions seamlessly interwoven for ease of listening and maximum comprehension. With all this in mind, let's get on with the reading. The Four Basic Postulates if one were to inquire into the nature of the quality or ability that is closest to life itself one would eventually arrive at the subject of knowing. Life can know. All else is the subject of methods or systems of knowing. The basic law, or agreement, of this universe is that one will only know that which is brought into existence to be known. Thus, this universe sets a limitation upon knowing as only being possible for the class of things which are brought into existence to be known. This law is peculiar to this universe. A being can only operate, that is to say, play games within this universe while in agreement with this law. Once he starts to know outside of this law he is operating outside the universe. The action of bringing something into existence so that it can be known is called creation. Thus, in this universe knowing is limited to those things which have been created in the universe. It should never be considered that knowing is by nature limited to those things which are created to be known. Life can know, it can know anything, whether it has been brought into existence to be known or not. In order to operate in this universe life considers, or agrees, that it will not know until something is brought into existence to be known. This limitation upon knowing is the basic law, and the only basic law, that governs this universe. Other universes can be constructed upon other basic laws, but they would all be some type of limitation of knowing, for while knowing is unlimited any type of universe or game is impossible. Bear the basic law of this universe in mind as you do the practical exercises of Trom, for all the games you have ever become trapped in in this universe have been based upon the basic law of the universe. A postulate is a causative consideration. A wish, a desire, and so on. Purpose, intention, goal and postulate can be regarded as synonyms. A game is a contest in conviction. A conviction by definition is a firmly held belief or opinion. A game is a contest of conviction could also be stated as, a game is a contest of trying to convince the other of your postulate without being convinced of theirs, a postulate being a causative consideration. I convince you of my postulate that I am the better chess player by beating you in a game of chess, for example. A woman convinces others she is the most attractive by winning a beauty contest, and so on. Conviction, then, is an enforcement of knowingness. This could also be written, conviction is enforced knowing. Dennis Stevens' writing style often uses the suffix n-e-s-s to turn verbs into nouns. Enforcement of knowingness is called importance. In other words, forcing to know something makes it important. Purposes are made more intense in order to make them more convincing. Thus, importance is the intensity of purpose. As the intensity, or importance, of a purpose approaches zero, so the purpose itself approaches zero. Importance bears the same relation to purpose as cattishness does to a cat. When all the cattishness has been removed the cat has gone too. Thus, to resolve a purpose in the mind it is only necessary to address the importance of this purpose, once this has been resolved the purpose itself will approach zero and finally vanish. This is the basis of all effective psychotherapy. Significance is the consideration of both the nature of a purpose and its importance. So, significance too approaches zero as the intensity, or importance, of that purpose approaches zero. There can be no significance in the absence of importance. Thus, importance is the basis of all significance. Since importance is an enforced knowingness, once the importance has gone the purpose too has vanished. 
Thus, all purposes are systems or methods of knowing, not knowing, making known, or making not known. These are the four basic postulates. Purposes are held in suspension in the mind by opposing purposes. Thus, a purpose can only be resolved in relation to its opposition, it can never be resolved in isolation. A pair of purposes in opposition is called a problem. Problems are the basic building blocks of games. The purpose of a game is to have fun. A game is won when the loser becomes convinced of the opponent's postulates. Thus, all games are essentially contests in conviction, and all failure is basically postulate failure. Postulate failure is known as an overwhelm. Overwhelming the postulate of an opponent in a game is known as an overt act. Having one's own postulates overwhelmed is called a motivator. The difference between win or lose and overt and motivator is a very fine one, and is determined solely by the considered value of the game. If the game is relatively trivial, then win or lose is applied, if the game is serious or important then overt and motivator is applied. In that the winning of a game brings about the end of the game and thus the loss of the game itself, winning and losing are junior considerations to the actual playing of the game. Thus, the playing of the game is senior to the considerations of win or lose. It is a rule of all games that intentionally lowering one's ability in order to be more evenly matched with the opponent leads inevitably to the state of an enforced loss of the game. Games are played in space and need time for their completion. In the absence of games, space and time cease to exist. Thus, conflicting postulates perpetuate space and time, while complementary postulates vanish it. Please note not to confuse complementary with an E with complementary with an I. To complement with an E is to complete. With an I it is to pay someone a compliment. They are not the same thing and it's important I mention this since you are listening and not reading. Complementary postulates are simply postulates that agree with each other or complete each other. A game to be worth playing must contain elements considered valuable. Value is monitored by the consideration of beauty and is increased by scarcity. But as both the effect and the consideration of value or beauty are generated by life, then life has a senior value to all things. Complementary postulates enhance life, conflicting postulates detract from it. Thus, games, although considered fun, have the liability of lessening the amount of life the being possesses. Games, by their very nature, can become compulsive and result in a lessening of life to such a degree that the true nature of life, postulates, and games themselves become unknown to the being. This state of affairs is only resolved, in the final instance, by the application of complementary postulates. Thus, complementary postulates, when applied, have the ability to dissolve all games. Postulates have a twin structure to them. The self-determined postulate is the one you make, and the pan-determined postulate is the one at the other end of the communication line, a communication line being the route which a communication travels from one point to another. This is often abbreviated to calm line. The to-be-known postulate is the creative postulate, the postulate that brings an effect into existence. His pan-determined postulate that goes with it at the other end of the communication line is to know. This twin postulate structure is still present even if the effect is only being created for the benefit of the creator, in this case he merely responds to his own pan-determined postulate and knows his own creation. Time is the postulate continue to be known, and is the postulate that introduces persistence into the creation. In games play there are many methods of ensuring persistence, so that others are not easily able to vanish a creation. The most basic method is the lie which calls the creation something which it is not. Thus, the perceiver only views the lie and is unable to vanish the original postulate, which remains hidden. Therefore, this late in the game very few things are what they appear to be, and illusions are rampant. The to-not-be-known postulate is the vanishing postulate, the postulate that takes the effect out of existence. His matching pan-determined postulate at the other end of the communication line is not no. However, due to the various persistence and mechanisms it's not easy these days to make a piece of the universe vanish for everyone. Consequently, 
the vanishing postulate has long since become the hiding postulate. The being, no longer able to make the effect vanish, has to be content with hiding it. The lie mechanism mentioned previously which ensures the persistency of a creation by calling it something different from what it is, is really an attempt to mask the truth and is a part of to not be known, but I included it in the to be known explanation for convenience. Be not known also uses the lie mechanism by further masking the truth so that the knower will not recognize the effect even when he finds it. To know is the postulate that permits the being to know the effect. His matching pan-determined postulate at the other end of the communication line is to be known, so the effect is there for him to know. To not know is the non-perception postulate. It is the postulate the being uses to permit him to be unaware of an effect. His matching pan-determined postulate at the other end of the communication line is to not be known. It's necessary to clearly differentiate the to not know postulate from to not be known. To not be known is a vanishing or hiding postulate. To not know is merely a desire not to perceive the effect. An example of the use of the postulate is a spiritual being looking through a wall, he chooses to not know the wall so he can perceive what is on the other side. However, due to the persistence of postulates of the universe the to not know postulate degenerates into an attempt to vanish the unwanted effect by force, then, failing that, to hide the effect from oneself. The Pan-Determined Postulates These are the hidden postulates in life, not because any attempt is being made to hide them, but merely because man the materialist cannot fit them into his theories about life, and so tends to discount their existence. Everyone knows about self-determined postulates, but few suspect the existence of their pan-determined twins at the other end of the communication line. Thus, being unknown or generally ignored, they tend to be highly effective. For example, how many people can resist a stray cat who wanders in and looks at you with his big, pleading eyes? You don't know it, but that sudden urge to get him a saucer of milk and a nice warm home is more his pan-determined postulate than your self-determined one. Animals, being entirely natural and not being educated to the contrary, use their pan-determined postulates to the full, thus making willing slaves out of us oh so much more intelligent and rational humans. Babies too are masters of the pan-determined postulate, they have yet to be educated out of their belief in the efficacy of such things. A large part of your work will be exercises in developing your pan-determined postulates, and becoming aware of the pan-determined postulates of others, for in our civilization it has become an almost totally neglected aspect of life. What is called a magnetic personality is entirely the conscious or unconscious use of pan-determined postulates. The subject of pan-determined postulates is the whole subject of action at a distance. Learn to use them, for they are an integral part of the abilities at your disposal. And now to cover the subject of time-breaking. Mental Mass, Definition The pictures in the mind contain energy and mass, or in plainer words, substance. The energy and force in pictures of painful or upsetting experiences can have a harmful effect upon an individual. This harmful energy or force is called charge. There is also physical universe mass, and for our purposes we define this simply as substance and can just be called mass, though mental mass in this work is often referred to as mass. Compulsive Games Condition Definition Compulsive games are the more serious games the being feels he must play, and are settled with overts and motivators. This is contrasted to a voluntary games condition wherein the game is less serious and win or lose applies. Anyone who has a mind is in a compulsive games condition with it. The entire secret of making any mental mass vanish is to re-evaluate its importance to present time realities to the point where it is considered so trivial that there is no longer any need to keep it in existence, at which moment the mass can be easily not known and will promptly vanish. While the mass is considered important it will continue in existence, and the being will continue to know it even though trying desperately to not know it. To try and vanish by means of force a mass while still holding the consideration that it is important is thus the height of stupidity, and can only lead to frustration and failure. Thus, 
we see that the re-evaluation of past importances is the only step required to achieve the vanishment of any mental mass. As a successful psychotherapy can be defined as a system that brings about the vanishment of unwanted mental conditions, we see that this data is vital to our goal. The ability to assign and unassign importances, while native to the being, will be found to require some attention on the root out. The assignment of the consideration of unimportance to a mental mass after having considered the mass important is merely an attempt to devalue it and is just another method of attempting to vanish it by means of force. Hence, we have no need to consider the subject of unimportance. Once one grasps that the need to regard a thing as unimportant is an importance in its own right, one has entirely got the flavor of all this. We have a being who can look at scenes. He can look at now scenes, and he can look at then scenes. The only difference is that then scenes are scenes of then and now scenes are scenes of now. If then seems less real than now, it is only because the being has made it so. A being can only communicate across a distance. He cannot communicate through time. So, when he is looking at a then he is looking at it now. Whatever he looks at, he looks at now. A being can view now from any viewpoint. A being can view then from any viewpoint. Thus, every moment in time is a complete universe which is viewable to the being. Viewpoint here is used in the sense of a position from which to view, and not in the sense of holding a mental opinion. Thus, a being is natively capable of viewing every particle that has ever been brought into existence in this, or any other universe, from any viewpoint he so desires. He is also natively capable of taking any of these particles back out of existence again if he so desires. Any changes you bring about, whether changes in then or changes in now you bring about now. So, any changes you make to then, later than when the event occurred will not by way of that fact produce changes in now. Thus, what is called the time paradox is exposed for the lie that it is. The assignment of importance to a thing, or class of things, automatically assigns importance to the opposite or absence of those things. Thus, if life is considered important, then death, the absence of life, has also been granted importance. If the concept of self is considered important, then the concept of not-self is thereby also granted importance. From this law we see the proliferation and self-perpetuating nature of games. The evaluation of things, one against the other, is achieved by the noting of differences and similarities between them. Evaluation is easiest when the two things are placed side by side in the same moment of time. Thus, a then importance and a now importance are best evaluated when viewed simultaneously in the same moment of time, now. The general action of simultaneously viewing a then and a now scene is called time breaking. The name derives from the fact that the action of time breaking breaks the temporal separation of then and now, and thus removes the command power of the past scene, so time broken. That which has been time broken no longer has a command power over the being. The ability to time break is native to the being, but due to the compulsive game's condition the being is in regarding his past the ability has been to a greater or lesser degree lost, and for many will have to be learned again almost from scratch. There are exercises to improve the ability. Time breaking is the basis of all psychotherapy. When the patient tells his therapist of some past happening, he is time breaking the happening for the therapist and the incident are thus brought into the same moment in time, now. However, a being can learn to time break solo, and thus dispense with the need for a separate therapist. A separate therapist is only required until such time as the patient is confident that they can do the job alone. From the viewpoint of the therapist, it's a matter of helping another until such time as they are capable of helping themselves, and all assistance should be given with this view in mind. Any other approach, although undoubtedly good for business, is just not in the best interest of the patient. The intensity of the compulsive game's condition between a being and his past is the sole factor that determines whether he can walk out of the trap unaided or will in the early stages require assistance from a separate therapist. There is in fact a test which readily determines whether a being can go solo from the word go or will need assistance early on from a separate therapist.
Due to the nature of the compulsive game's conditions between a being and his past, the more he is willing to time-break it the less he has to time-break. Very soon he is left with nothing to time-break, and has to actively stimulate the past if he wishes to continue the exercise. He soon goes from the cringing victim, afraid to tamper with his mind, to the triumphant victor pursuing the remnants wherever he can find them. Level 1. The exercises in this section serve two functions, the first in that they are a test to see if the level 1 exercises need to be performed on you, and also they are an exercise you will repeat during the rest of your trauma therapy. The actual processes of level 1, if you need them, are performed by a separate therapist. Everyone who has a mind is in a compulsive games condition with it, and therefore to some degree out of touch with the realities of present time. It is entirely a matter of the degree to which he is out of touch. Only when this is above the make-break point is it safe for the being to contact his past. This is true whether the being is working solo or with a separate therapist. Fortunately, only a small percentage of humanity are below this make-break point. So only a tiny portion of humanity requires level 1 to be run, but if it's necessary it must be run before level 2 is attempted, for the mere attempt to do level 2 can precipitate a psychotic break. One who needs level 1 exercises run by a separate therapist needs to improve their contact with and reality of present time before they can attempt level 2 safely. It's as simple as that, nothing else is involved. In order to contact his mind, he has to take a little bit of attention off present time. That may be more attention than he can afford. So before we go into level 2, I'd like to introduce you to the repair of importances exercise. This is a simple exercise that will stay with you during the rest of your solo work. The response to this exercise also determines whether or not it's safe for a person to undertake level 2, or will require to complete level 1 first. People who fail the test yet insist upon continuing with level 2 do so entirely at their own risk. I can only warn you of the dangers, not insist that you abide by my warning. If you successfully pass the test, the repair of importances also known as our I will always get you out of any difficulties the later exercises may get you into. However, only a person who doesn't need level 1 run on him can make our I work for them, and so has this guarantee. I trust I've made my point. As that which is considered important tends to persist and become more solid, we find the being in the state of actually believing that he needs to be surrounded by mass and solidity, it's the importance he craves, not the mass and solidity, this soon reaches the point where he feels bad if this mass begins to vanish. Left to himself he solves any scarcity by attracting more old mental masses. As these old mental masses also contain various unpleasant sensations like pain, and so on, he will attract these things in order to be surrounded by the accompanying mass. It's an incredible mechanism and explains so much of life. The exercises from level 2 onwards tend to dissolve mental mass at an accelerating rate. Thus, the exercise is at variance with his compulsion to be surrounded by mass or importance. This is a very real dilemma and there is only one final solution to it and that is the being must replace the old mass or importance with mass of his own creation. In this way he can do the exercises which vanish the unwanted mental mass without compulsively attracting further unwanted mental masses to fill the vacuum so produced. In the final instance this is the only way that he will ever let go of his mind. As long as he thinks he needs importances, he will never permit one to vanish until he is assured that he can easily replace it with another. Early on the being is like a prisoner who has been incarcerated in a cell for all of his life. He has come to believe that he needs the walls of his prison, and if suddenly freed will demand to be locked up once more, failing this he will rush into the nearest room, slam the door after him and hide. This mechanism is well known by prison authorities who have to deal with long-term prisoners, it is one of the hidden benefits of the parole system. Right now, you are like such a long-term prisoner regarding your own mental mass. You've come to believe that you need it, and so will pull and round yourself more mental mass to replace that which the exercises cause to vanish. Thus, we have to repair the importances we vanish with self-generated importances or the being will soon get himself into a frightful mess. 
he will find himself in possession of highly persistent aches and pains he knows not what of, as well as a host of other unpleasant emotions and sensations. This mechanism if not understood and allowed for will sooner or later bring any psychotherapy to a grinding halt. The researcher was thus led to believe that his therapy was of no use, when in fact it was working all too well. The repair of importance's commands are in the manual. For the sake of this audiobook, I am only going to describe what is done in the process, as I don't want you either purposefully or inadvertently doing these exercises while driving, working out or falling asleep. It's best you read them from the manual and follow all instructions. So, the repair of importance's exercise consists of a set of commands where you, with your mind, imagination, visualization, or however you most comfortably want to put it, place things around you, first as your own creations, then conceiving that someone else has created them. While running our eye it is not necessary to perceive one's creations. The certainty that one has created is sufficient. Early on many beings find themselves plagued by non-perception screens which prevent them from perceiving their own creations. As you progress through the levels, you'll become more and more aware of these screens. Finally, you'll vanish them and thereafter be able to perceive your own creations. There is another class of R.I. called R.I. by perception. This is where the being repairs his scarcity of importances by increasing his contact with, and reality of, an existing importance in the present time physical universe. As any solid object has a residual importance postulate within it, we therefore see that a being can repair his scarcity of importance by physically contacting such a solid present time physical universe object. Grasping such an object with your hands and feeling its solidity, temperature, texture, and so on, will repair importance. The only difference between the two methods is that in the creative version the being is actually generating the importance. He's got to be able to do this eventually, and the sooner he gets onto it the better. Our eye by perception will work all right up to the top of level 4, but level 5, being intensely destructive of mental mass, really does require the creative version to permit its successful completion. The immediate effect of running our eye is the de-intensification of any compulsive games condition you are currently engaged in whether with your mind or with life in general. It cools the game. Thus, the exercise is an extremely valuable one for a being to use at any time. It de-intensifies stress of all types and is infinitely preferable to the taking of drugs for this purpose. Just before you sink the meat axe into your mother-in-law's skull paws and run a little R.I., you'll find you'll be able to put the axe away. The main use of R.I. during the exercises is to act as a lubricant. It keeps things going smoothly. It should be used in generous amounts. It must be used at the following times. A. Between the ending of one exercise and the start of a new one. B. At the end of every session. C. At the beginning of every session. D. During the session if the going gets rough. Bluntly, levels 2 through 5 will not work in the absence of R.I. and will very soon grind to a shuddering and rather painful halt. We are now in a position to determine whether or not you can begin at level 2 or will require to complete level 1. The test is very simple. Just work your way through the list of R.I. commands. Creative ones first. Give each pair a good run before you move on. You are looking for changes. Any changes. If it produces any change, it's a usable R.I. command. If none of the creative list produce a change, then try R.I. by perception. All right, I haven't forgotten the rest of you. Don't tell me, nothing happened. It all seems silly, does it? Tell me. Did running perceptive R.I. make you feel a wee bit queasy in your stomach? Touching all those solid objects? It did. Good. Continue with it until you feel relaxed once more. You are up to doing level 2. Just make with the pause on the furnishings for an hour or two, it will work wonders for you. However, if you don't feel up to it, then go and see a separate therapist who is skilled in level 1 exercises and let him help you do it. And, finally, those to whom absolutely nothing happened at all during the test. 
you aren't up to tackling your mind solo right now. Don't try it, it could put you in hospital. You need level 1. Go see a separate therapist and get it run. Instructions for how to find such a therapist are in the appendix of TROM 2023 printed edition of which this audiobook supplements. Level 2. Purpose to find the past. To exercise the being in evaluating the past to the present. Now I'll be brutally honest with you. If you need this level running badly, it's going to hurt. It all depends upon how severe the compulsive games condition is between you and your mind. If you're rather chummy with your mind, the exercise will be a breeze, and you'll enjoy it as well as deriving benefit from it. However, if you are a mass of so-called repressions and inhibitions you are in for a hot time of it. You'll probably be absolutely sure that you are going to die before you've got your teeth a couple of inches into this level. There's nothing like level 2 to separate the men from the boys. Crack this one, and the rest is easy. However, the level must be done, for there's no other way to get a being to be able to time break. Use our eye liberally. Don't be a martyr, run our eye when the going gets rough, you've nothing to gain by suffering any more than you have to. This level is designed to crack the compulsive games condition you are currently in with your own mind. It does it with ruthless efficiency to the full extent you are currently capable of achieving. But I'll tell you this, once you come out the other end, you'll have lost all fear of your own mind. You'll know with absolute certainty that there's nothing it can do to you that you can't handle. You're over the biggest hump. The being who has successfully completed level 2 has said goodbye to separate therapists, he now knows he can do what must be done alone. If this technology ever becomes lost to mankind it will only be because some faint hearts could not confront the horrors of level 2, and so will change it all into something pleasant and useless. Never miss it, level 2 is the only barrier that sits between mankind and the attaining of nirvana. He cannot face level 2, and so he goes to a separate therapist to help him through it, never realizing that by so doing he has negated his own responsibility in the matter, and so doomed himself to failure. He must do this step alone. Once again, the specific commands for this exercise are found in the manual. Level 2 involves taking objects from one's past and setting them next to objects in present time and noting differences and similarities between the then and now objects. Continue the exercise, using more and more significant past objects, until no more change occurs with any past object you care to select. Now do the exercise with past persons. Select them one at a time, and complete the exercise with each person. Continue until no more change occurs with any past person you care to select. As you do this exercise, and the compulsive games condition between you and your mind begins to break down, you'll find that it becomes progressively easier to place the then, and now objects side by side for comparison purposes, until you are quite easily able to view both the then and now objects simultaneously. You are learning to time break. By the time the exercise has gone null you'll be an expert timebreaker. Don't rush the exercises, nothing is to be gained by so doing. Once started on a past object or person you should persist with the object or person. To change around all the time will not make it easier for you, you are just prolonging the agony and the exercise. Run the changes out as you go, that is always the fastest way. Remember, you are running out a compulsive games condition between you and your own past. The exercise continues to produce changes as long as this compulsive games condition is highly charged, as the compulsive games condition quietens down, so the exercise ceases to produce change. You end up feeling quite different about your past, quite friendly towards it as well as being a competent timebreaker, and so ready for level 3. Level 3 General Time Breaking Time Breaking Definition The Simultaneous Viewing of Then and Now If Level 2 has been properly done then Level 3 will be easy. It's just a romp around your past, learning your skills and applying them. However, if you've skidded off Level 2 and hoped to find salvation in Level 3 then I have some bad news for you. Either nothing will happen, 
or all the things you hope to avoid will come back and haunt you at level 3. And, what is more, you'll be stuck with them from here on out. You've either cooled this compulsive game's condition you're in with your past at level 2, or you haven't. Level 3 is no place to be playing this sort of game simply because while you are still playing it you cannot effectively time break, and the exercises will not benefit you. So, if in doubt about whether level 2 is finished then it's not finished and you must go back and finish it. Then and only then will level 3 help you. Once level 2 is complete the being is able to comfortably place then and now objects side by side for comparison purposes. Indeed, it will be found that the comparison has become largely automatic. Once he so places them the comparison occurs almost instantly. This is as it should be. A being cannot view through time, this is an illusion. He can only view across a distance. Everything you view, you view right now. The action of simultaneously viewing then, and now breaks the illusion of time. While the being continues to try and compare the then and now objects while still considering them in different moments in time he never achieves a full comparison, thus, he never achieves a true evaluation of their relative importance, and the then object still retains a residual command power over him. Once time broken, the command power of the then object is vanished forever. This cannot be done until the illusion of time is broken, the illusion of time is broken once it is done. There's nothing mystical about this, it's all good, solid natural law. How can his past influence him if his past is now in the present? The commands for level 3 can be found in the manual. It is an act of viewing incidents from one's past while maintaining awareness of the present. This exercise will take many hours, joyful hours and you are gaining all the way. The past will first be found to become increasingly intense in perceptics, then to progressively vanish. As the level nears completion, you'll be hard put to find new scenes to time break, and will be searching for them. This is quite normal. Run our eye as necessary. The exercise is not particularly destructive of importances compared to level 2, but our eye will speed your progress considerably. Every so often you'll come across a scene that just will not time break. Not to worry. Just roll up your sleeves and drop back to level 2 regarding it and start finding some differences and similarities between the scene and the present. Suddenly it will flip out easily. Run a bit of R.I. at this point. You've found a sticker. There's something in that scene, more to it than meets the casual gaze. You'll be picking that one up again later on level 4 or 5. At this stage, we are only interested in time-breaking it. During this level, or the subsequent ones, you'll find yourself occupying a viewpoint exterior to your body in the present. You'll also find yourself occupying exterior viewpoints to the ones you occupied at the time during the past scenes. All this is quite normal. A being is natively capable of occupying any viewpoint he so desires in any scene, whether then or now. Although the past will progressively vanish during this level, nothing is being lost except the enforcement to view it, any part of your past that has been time-broken can easily be brought back into existence once more merely by desiring to view it. As you complete this level you will get your first preview of Nirvana. For the first time you will feel free of your past, and no longer feel it pressing around you, the endless chatter of the mind will at last be still, and you'll be able to experience the tranquility of utterly still beingness. Unless you actually recall something, your past will remain in a state of total vanishment. This, again, is as it should be. Additional Trom Theory Emotions These are particles a being creates to let other people know how the game is going. There is a scale of emotions from apathy up to serenity. They are very light particles, and as soon as you touch them in recall, they change to other emotions further up the scale. The lowest emotional tone one could be in, and still be alive, is apathy. Above that is grief, then fear, then anger, hostility, boredom, contentedness, cheerfulness and finally enthusiasm at the top of the human emotional scale. There are shades in between each of those emotions that you can learn about, but for the purpose of how this is relates to trauma therapy, this list will suffice. If you are time-breaking an incident where someone has just died, you may feel the grief from that incident. 
Upon further time breaking, the grief will turn into fear, then anger, then hostility, and then at boredom you may have the incident, or at least the emotional part of it fading away. However, it is not unusual to go up the scale further and at the end of time breaking an incident to feel cheerful or enthusiastic. Sensations These are particles which occur at the boundary between opposing postulates. Like emotions, there is a scale of sensations. As the space opens up the sensations change to ones further up the scale going from pain which is a sensation in very collapsed space to sexual sensation. Then tickles. Then heat. Then electrical sensations then color, and finally pure aesthetics at the top. These are some of the well-known landmarks on the scale. There are nearly infinite shades in between. Emotions and sensations are very elusive things when you contact them in recall, as soon as you touch them, they vanish and become something else further upscale. Blame and guilt. Cause is the action of bringing an effect into existence, taking an effect out of existence, knowing or not knowing. That which is brought into existence, taken out of existence, known, or not known is called an effect. Thus life, in all its manifestations, is causative. Causation is the common denominator of all life impulses. Causation is achieved by postulates. A postulate is a causative consideration. A consideration is defined as a thought, or idea. Life can believe itself to be an effect, but that belief is itself a causative consideration. Responsibility is the willingness to assume causation. A being can assume causation for anything. The only liability to assuming causation is to run the being out of games. The only liability to not assuming causation is to give the being an excessive amount of games. Thus, as games become progressively more compulsive, the willingness to assume causation or in other words, responsibility, is seen to lessen. Unwillingness to assume causation is thus a measure of the compulsiveness to play games in a being. Complementary postulates enhance affinity, conflicting postulates lessen affinity. Thus, affinity is the willingness to create complementary postulates. Love is the expression of affinity. Reality is the degree to which complementary postulates are created. Thus, as games become progressively more compulsive things become progressively less real to the being. Things are only as real as one is creating complementary postulates regarding them. Communication is the action of creating complementary postulates. When two or more beings adopt complementary postulates regarding a creation they share that creation, which is now a co-creation. They are said to be in agreement regarding that creation. Thus, agreement is a shared creation. Beings, by means of their willingness to create complementary postulates which is, affinity, and by actually creating complementary postulates which is, communication, achieve co-creation which is, reality. Thus, understanding is achieved between beings. Games, because they contain conflicting postulates, lessen understanding between beings. A right action is a lovable action, it is an action that one is willing to create complementary postulates with. A wrong action is an unlovable action, it is an action that one is unwilling to create complementary postulates with. Thus, the concept of right and wrong is a concept brought about by games. There is no absolute right and no absolute wrong. What is considered right or wrong is relative to the being and the games he is playing. Thus, what is considered a right action in one society can be a capital offense in another. A game's rule is an agreement between beings denoting permissible play. Play outside of the rules is considered improper and therefore wrongful play. Laws are game's rules denoting permissible play in a society. Thus, to accuse another of a wrong action is to accuse him of acting outside the rules of the game, it is to accuse him of unethical behavior. A being, having lost a game played fairly within the rules, can either accept the loss or attempt to imply that the victor had committed wrongful play. These are the only two choices open to him. If he can convince his opponent that he has committed wrongful play he, the victor, will believe that he has behaved unethically and did not win the game fairly. The action of assigning causation for wrongful play to an opponent is called blame. If the opponent accepts the blame, he feels guilt. Not wishing to behave in an unethical manner the guilty being resolves not to play in such a manner again. This, of course, is the precise effect intended by the blamer, who, now having succeeded in limiting his opponent's willingness to act, is more easily able to overwhelm him. Thus, blame is seen as an attempt to lower another's willingness to act by invoking the suggestion of wrongful play, and thereby make him easier to overwhelm. The blame and guilt mechanism is pure games play. The purpose of blame is only to permit the blamer to win games. Unable to win games any other way, and having the need to win games, he resorts to the blame mechanism in order to do so. 
in that any life game has a near infinite number of possibilities within it, and that it is clearly impossible to draw up game rules for all of them, the blame and guilt mechanism is always available to a games player. There is always some action he can point his finger at, declare it wrongful, and so attempt to make his opponent feel guilty and thus use less than his full abilities in the playing of the game. As a wrong act is essentially an unlovable act, the use of the blame mechanism is pure emotional blackmail. It's saying, I'll withdraw my love or affinity from you if you continue to act in such a manner that prevents me from winning the game. However, blame has the liability of having to convince the other being that a wrongness has occurred. So, the blamer has to keep the wrongness in existence in order to convince the other that it has occurred. Thus, we find the blamer having to keep whole sections of his mind in existence in order to convince others that he has been wronged. It is a terrible price to pay for his compulsion to win games, but it clearly shows the limits to which beings will go in order to do so. The blame and guilt mechanism breeds compulsive games play. Compulsive games play breeds the blame and guilt mechanism. They are inseparable, and where you find one you will always find the other. By means of the blame and guilt mechanism life finally degenerates into a frantic attempt to make others guilty while equally frantically resisting their attempts to do the same thing to you. At this level life is seen by the player as one vast sea of wrongness containing one tiny island of rightness, that being himself. And he knows above all things that if he stops assigning wrongness or in other words, blame, for even one instant his island will sink, and he will drown and be lost forever in that sea of wrongness. It's not that the compulsive blamer is always right, it's just that he has a vast need to be right. He is always right. Even when he is wrong, he is right. And he'll still be protesting his rightness when the coffin lid is nailed down on him. For he knows how to win games, always make sure that self is right and others are wrong. It becomes what's written on his gravestone. This is how the subject of right and wrong got into games play. As the compulsion to play games lessens, the need to invoke the blame and guilt mechanism also lessens and finally vanishes. It always was a crummy mechanism, and games are much more fun and healthier without it. Reasons why for postulates Reasons why for a postulate always come later than the postulate for which they are created as the reasons why. The postulate always comes later than the desire to make that postulate. The sequence is always desire, postulate. Reasons why for that postulate. The reasons why for a postulate are only justifications to convince others that the postulate is reasonable. Thus, reasons why are only created in order to justify a postulate and always come later in time than the postulate. The postulate, in turn, is always later than the desire to achieve the effect which the postulate puts into action. The closest you can ever come to a reason why for a postulate is that it seemed like a good idea at the time. Now it is true that a being, feeling unable to dream up convincing reasons why to justify a postulate, will not make that postulate. But these are reasons why for not making a postulate, not reasons why for making one. The truth is that a being never needs a reason why for making a postulate until he has made that postulate, and needs convincing reasons to justify it to others. His postulates stem from his desires, his desires stem from his urge to be alive and in there playing the game. It's easy to see how the general belief that the reasons why for a postulate preceded the making of the postulate came about. The being, having made a postulate and now having to dream up convincing reasons why he made that postulate in order to make the postulate appear reasonable to others, will always swear on a stack of Bibles that his reasons for making the postulate existed prior to the making of the postulate. For to admit otherwise is to open him up to the charge that he's making postulates without due reason why, and then justifying them afterwards. The only way he can defend his postulate as being reasonable is to swear that the reasons for making the postulate existed prior to the making of the postulate. Eventually he comes to believe his own lie, and becomes trapped in a web of reason. If a being ever needed a reason why to make a postulate, then the first postulate ever made in the universe could never have been made, for at the time it was made no reasons why for postulates existed. That first postulate could only have been made from a desire to achieve a certain state of affairs. That is the way it was then, and that is the way it has been ever since. The mind, then, is full of convincing reasons why one should not make postulates, but it contains no reasons why a postulate has been made. Of course, one can always point to some part of the mind and assign it as the reason why one has a compulsion to kick cats, say, but this assigning is coming later than the postulate to kick cats. If you wish to be free of your compulsion to kick cats you need to address this postulate to kick cats and the whole subject of cats and kicking. There is clearly a compulsive games condition here between you and cats. Ransacking your mind and assigning reasons why to your compulsion to kick cats will not help you in the slightest. That can only be resolved by resolving your compulsion to play games with cats. 
The mind, then, is only resolved by addressing postulates and the subject of games which are postulates in conflict. Reasons why for the postulates always come later than the postulates, and so have no part in the resolution of the postulates in conflict. When you fully grasp this, you will stop ransacking your mind in a futile attempt to discover the reasons why for your current mental state. For the only reasons why you will discover there are, are the ones you are putting there now, and they are all later than the event. It's futile searching a stable for a horse that has gone, but it's bordering on the ridiculous to search a stable for a horse that was never there, and then convince yourself that the piece of straw you find is really the horse. It is only ignorance of the truth of this matter that causes patients to spend years with psychotherapists in search of the reasons why for their troubles, and why psychotherapists waste their own and their patients' time in such a futile search. The only justification for the activity is that it's profitable for the therapist, and the patient always lives in hopes that he might one day get somewhere. Once you grasp the truth about this subject of postulates and reasons why you will also learn to cut through the smokescreen of reasons why that others throw up to justify their postulates, and be able to see their naked desire and postulates clearly exposed. The brush salesman may give you a thousand convincing reasons why you ought to buy his brush, but all of them come later than the fact that he desires to sell a brush to you. Life gets very simple once you realize that the correct sequence is desire, postulate, then reasons why, invented, for the postulate. A person may search their mind for the reason why of some unwanted mental condition. Having, assigned, a reason why that is convincing to them, they promptly blame it for the unwanted mental condition. This is compounding the lie, and only traps them further in the blame and guilt mechanism, and in the whole subject of conviction and justification. The unwanted mental condition is essentially a postulate, which is held in place by the compulsive game's condition with its opposition postulate. Only when addressed in this context will the unwanted mental condition resolve. The Postulate Failure Cycle It's inevitable in games play where one pits their postulate against another, there is going to be a failure. Postulates fail and change in a particular sequence. For example, if you are wanting to make something known, or in other words, forcing it to be known, and postulating it must be known then you are going to overwhelm the other into knowing it, forcing them into the must-know postulate. That's how it all starts. Your self-determined postulate of must-be-known is at the same time a pan-determined postulate of must-know for the other. You've overwhelmed your opponent, so to speak. You've committed an overt, your opponent receives a motivator, and is forced to adopt your pan-determined postulate of must-know as his own self-determined postulate of must-know. But then your opponent throws a must-not-know postulate at your created effect, committing the overt, you receiving a motivator, and now your postulate regarding the effect is must not be known because that is the result of his must not know postulate when it succeeds, it throws you into must not be known. You can also look at this as you forcing him to know and him responding with a postulate that prevents from being known, namely his not know postulate. Let's see how an entire cycle of these overwhelms could occur in real life. A little girl screams at her father. She forces him to know her. He covers her mouth, preventing her from being known. The girl runs away, preventing her father from knowing her. I want to interrupt our little story here to point out that once the father prevents her from being known, in other words, enforces his must-not-know postulate on her by covering her mouth, she reactively makes the corresponding must-not-be-known postulate and is now actively making sure that her father does not know her by running away. This, in turn makes the father pursue her because he now opposes the very postulate he pushed her into which she is now dramatizing, but as her own. It's kind of like she is saying, hey, I want you to know me, but if you don't want to know me, I am going to make sure you don't know me. On with the story. The father reacts to this by looking for the girl. Now he overwhelms her with his must-know postulate, driving her back into must-be-known, but this time against her will, as opposed to her being in must be known causatively like she was at the beginning with the screaming. This postulate overwhelm, from the viewpoint of the girl is called forced to be known. So, the girl is found by her father, and he discovers she is smoking. Now consider carefully what happens next and why. The girl has already tried and failed in her must be known postulate, and then failed in her must not be known postulate. So, she isn't going to react to being discovered like this with either of those postulates. Instead, 
she is going to go into her father's valence. Remember, a valence is an identity assumed in games play. He's obviously won this round of the game, so she is going to adopt his postulate of must know. He found her and discovered she is smoking. She's forced to be known. She is going to turn the tables and force him to be known now. The girl sneaks into her father's office late at night and discovers a bottle of liquor in his desk drawer. She is committing the forcing to be known overwhelm, not just forcing him to be known, but also his drinking, as she exposes him to the mother. The father wants to make sure nothing like this happens again, so he puts a lock on his office door. He is now preventing the girl from knowing. But he doesn't just do that. He starts distancing himself from the girl, which also prevents her from knowing him. The girl obligates the father. He is preventing himself from being known, thus preventing her from knowing him, so she not knows him. In other words, she was forced into not know, and now she is actively making that postulate her own, so to speak. But the father does not like being ignored like this, and he now gets forceful as far as getting her attention, and forces her to know him. Now we started out with the girl forcing the father to know, and now the girl is at the end of the cycle being forced to know. She has given and received all possible overwhelms. All postulates are now in failure. What happens next? Two things, first, another valence shift. Her father is forcing her to know him, so she goes into her father's valence and forces him to know her. But she started the last game by screaming and look where that led her to eventually. Complete postulate failure. So, she starts a new cycle with a new effect. Now instead of screaming to get attention, she breaks dishes. And so on and so forth, the cycle repeating, and in this case, things just get worse and worse between the father and the child. And having grown up being overwhelmed by and overwhelming an alcoholic back and forth, it's no surprise she becomes one herself later in life. I will now express this series of events just labeling what the overwhelms are. 1. Forcing to know. 2. Prevented from being known. 3. Preventing from knowing. 4. Forced to be known. 5. Forcing to be known. 6. Prevented from knowing. 7. Preventing from being known. 8. Forced to know. Then a new cycle would begin after that with forcing to know, but with a new effect. When you get to level 4 of TROM, this series of overts and motivators, known as the 8 classes of overwhelm are run in reverse. After all, one gets into the trap in a certain sequence, so one gets out of the trap by reversing that sequence. These overwhelms also appear on the postulate failure cycle chart used in level 5, which gets more complex in that you aren't just dealing with overwhelms, you are also dealing with the conflicts that occur in between the overwhelms. The sum of these experiences on the goal to know regarding a succession of effects and substitute effects we call the mind. Basically, then, the mind is best considered as a collection of past importance. Past importances have a command power over the being in the present. However, as these various past importances are contacted and re-evaluated to present-time realities the mind will be found to become progressively less persisting and less and less solid, and will finally vanish. The command power of the mind over the being is only the command power of the postulates it contains. Once these have been contacted and re-evaluated to present-time realities the mind, as an entity, will be found to vanish. As the mind contains no postulates that have not been put there by the being during the playing of various games through time, it is of no value to him, and unless required for reference or aesthetic purposes is best kept in a state of vanishment. The being enters games at a desire level, they later become an enforcement, and then an inhibition. Thus, the being will be found to be in a game's condition regarding his past games. The being will be found to be in a game's condition with his own mind. As the mind only contains his own past postulates, he cannot possibly ever win the game against it. It is the one game he can only lose. Extreme examples of failure in this game we call insanity. Any attempt to create an effect upon the mind will cause it to resist the effect. The greater the attempt to create an effect upon it the more resistive it becomes. 
any attempt to withdraw from it will cause the mind to seemingly pursue the being. Hence, the well-known feeling of being stuck with one's own mind. Any attempt to know the mind will cause the mind to seemingly adopt of mustn't be known and become progressively more elusive. Any attempt to resist the mind will cause the mind to immediately enforce itself upon the being and overwhelm him. These are all postulate conflicts of must be known versus must not know and must know versus mustn't be known between the being and his mind and vice versa. These compulsive games condition between the being and his own mind accounts for the widespread apathy over doing something about the mind, for most beings have long since fought themselves to a standstill on the subject and have become resigned to what they consider the inevitable. Thus, it can be clearly seen that the mind can never be resolved by going into a game's condition with it, for whichever role the being adopts his mind will invariably overwhelm him. The key to the resolution of the mind, then, lies in exercising the being in the discovery and creation of complementary postulates, and unraveling the tangled mass of conflicting postulates that his mind has become. The mind, being a collection of postulates in conflict has no defense against the application and reinjection of complementary postulates regarding the effects it contains. In short, we vanish the mind by progressively getting the being to create and do exercises in complementary and conflicting postulates to create an experience overt and motivator overwhelms, play games, and generally bring back under his control these four basic postulates. Level 4 Purpose, the systematic discharge of the eight classes of overwhelm. The completion of level 3 signifies the end of your mind impinging upon you in session involuntarily. However, it will still be found to impinge upon you involuntarily in life to some degree, even if you are now capable of time breaking it back out of existence again as fast as it appears. You'll find that you just cannot maintain your state of inner stillness amidst the hurly burly of life. Away from life and alone, you can by time-breaking get yourself to a state of total peace and relaxation in a matter of minutes, but you'll find it difficult to maintain it while on the hoof, so to speak. It's now time to do something about this state of affairs. There are clearly still things in that their mind of yours that you know not what of. This is the whole subject of level 4. Once level 3 is complete you'll find that you have to actively stimulate your mind in session before any of it will appear. What is happening is that it's becoming more and more under your control, and less and less under the stimulus response control of the environment. From this point onwards you can expect this tendency to increase. Eventually, only you will be able to stimulate your mind, the environment will have lost its power to do so. To do this we have to take up the whole subject of games. Playing games got you into the mess and the understanding of games will get you out of it once more. You used to be an expert games player. You are going to be an even greater expert very soon. Never miss it. The route to nirvana for the compulsive games player is through the voluntary playing of games and then out the other side. You don't get there by running away from them and contemplating your navel. You get there by running through the whole gamut of games play in exercise form. That is level 5. Level 4 prepares you for this by getting you to take a look at the subject of overwhelms. You need to free this up before you embark upon the rigors of level 5. The eight classes of overwhelm as mentioned before, are addressed in the reverse of how they occur in life. Here they are again. 1. Forced to know. 2. Preventing from being known. 3. Prevented from knowing. 4. Forcing to be known. 5. Forced to be known. 6. Preventing from knowing. 7. Prevented from being known. 8. Forcing to know. We are going to work our way round this list, from 1 to 8, round and round, time-breaking everything that shows up as we go. There's no need to be shy about the nasty things you've done in your time, we've all done such things. You're working solo, and no one but you need ever know about the gruesome details. That's right, now you can time break there's no longer any need for the confessional. You become your own confessor. Just time break it all out, that's all it's necessary to do. Get it all nicely time broken, the guilt feelings, the blame, the shame, the regret, the whole works. 
Lock the door and plug up the keyhole if it makes you feel a little bit better. But let's get it done, shall we? The precise commands for level 4 are in the written version of TROM 2023. Essentially you address each one of the overwhelms on this list one after another then back to the beginning of the list. Continue round and round the list until there is no further new material and no further change. When in doubt, run the repair of importances exercise to replace mental mass lost by doing this exercise. As you work with these commands you will find that you are taking bits here and bits there out of incidents. That's quite all right. Many upsetting incidences contain more than one type of overwhelm, really hot ones can contain all eight. You can see how it is that beings get into such a terrible mess with these things. One thing we know about games play, it's never orderly, anything can happen and sooner or later will. These overwhelms come apart best in the sequence I've given them. They come apart this way much better than trying to run the incidents in a consecutive time sequence. There's nothing which says an incident has to be run in its strict temporal sequence, that is just being a slave to the illusion of time. The sequence you are using is the basic game sequence, the sequence in which the whole mind is stacked. That's why it comes apart easiest this way. So run the sequence from 1 to 8, round and round, and you'll get there fastest. Early on only a few commands will produce material, then later other commands will spark off and produce for you. Soon you'll be finding charge on all of them. Just clean each one up thoroughly before you leave it. Then they all begin to fade, until finally you are unable to punch any new material into view for time-breaking. The environment is now virtually incapable of triggering your mind against your conscious choice. Only you can do it now, and even you are having trouble. Only the creation of raw postulates can take you further. That is the whole subject of Level 5. Level 5 Level 5 is worked entirely using the postulate failure cycle chart. It is advised that before you continue to listen you print a copy of it and study along with the reading, or if you intend to listen to this while doing other things, study the chart first before listening to the rest of this recording. The purpose of Level 5 is to exercise the being in the creation of complementary and conflicting postulates in accordance with the postulate failure cycle chart. The completion of Level 4 signals that the being is ready to work with pure postulates. In point of fact, he has no choice in the matter, for only by the creation of postulates is he able to progress further. Nothing else is capable of stimulating his mind, and so producing material for time-breaking. At Level 2 the being only has to think of something in order to have mental mass flying round his ears. By the time level 4 is complete only the creation of raw postulates will trigger his mind in the slightest. This is as it should be. Raw postulates are very rare things in life these days, which is precisely why the being's mind is so little triggered by life once level 4 is completed. Humanity at large does not create effects by direct postulates, they cannot use direct postulates, they work on systems of getting things done. A man may shout and rave at you, but it's all noise and bluster, the actual postulate content of his tirade is virtually nil. If he were capable at handling postulates, he would speak in a whisper, and people would feel compelled to do as he asks. The power of the silent postulate. Mankind has many systems of power. Wealth is one of them. It permits a man to make his postulates effective when the true power of his postulate is close to zero. As the being comes up the line, he progressively abandons his systems of power and returns to the direct postulate. And in so doing his life becomes incredibly simple and uncomplicated. When we reach level 5 we are, as they say, down to the nitty-gritty, the basic building blocks upon which the mind is built, the four basic postulates which go to make up life and games play. A postulate is a causative consideration, it is a consideration which contains an intention that something will occur. One creates a postulate like one creates anything else, one brings it into existence in a certain location in space. Early on you may like to surround your postulates with mass. That is quite all right. You can create them with pink stripes and funny hats on if you wish, they are, after all, your creations. Later on, you'll be able to do without the mass, and just create the pure postulate. A being tends to feel at the completion of level 4 that there is very little of his mind left. This is not so. The truth of the matter is that the vast majority of the mind is still there intact at the completion of level 4. The illusion of vanishment only occurs because there are so few pure postulates in everyday life to stimulate the mind, so it stays out of existence. 
So even though level 4 is complete we still have a residual hardcore of mind left, and our job on level 5 is to bring it into view so it can be time broken. As your power of postulate increases on level 5, so you'll be able to spring more and more of this into view, this in turn will improve your power of postulate even more, which will permit you to spring even deeper levels into view. And so on until the job is finally done. How capable will you be? I don't know, for to the very best of my knowledge no one has got there yet. At this point take out the postulate failure cycle chart and study it. The chart is divided into eight major levels, each level is subdivided into two sections. This gives us a total of 16 possible game situations regarding an effect. You'll also notice that the chart is divided into origin and receipt, and self and others. Self and others is self-explanatory. Origin means the originator in a game, receipt means the responder in a game. Receipt responds to origin, origin causes receipt to respond. It's purely a matter of who starts, or originates, the game. So, we have 16 possible game situations regarding an effect. There aren't any others. The 16 consist of 4 overt overwhelms, 4 motivator overwhelms, 4 origin of games, and 4 receipt of games. The being, in life, enters games with an effect at the bottom of the chart, after all possible postulate conflicts have played out, he quits playing games with this effect at the top. No more games are possible with this effect once the top has been reached, as all four postulates are now in failure both as self-determined and pan-determined. Check it through and you will see that this is so. He now goes back in at the bottom with a substitute effect and starts all over again. So, the chart is really circular and should be folded round to form a cylinder. Next, I'd like to recap for you, so you are absolutely sure of what we are doing on level 5. It's necessary to be very clear in your mind on the differences between the following life situations. A no-game situation. This is a complementary postulate situation. You look at a wall, the wall is there to be known, and so you know it. It's to be known and to know, complementary postulates. This is not a game situation. There is no postulate conflict, all the postulates match up remember, complementary postulates enhance affinity, conflicting postulates detract from it. A voluntary game situation. This is a conflicting postulate situation. You look at a wall, the wall is there to be known, and you decide you don't want to know about it. It's be known and not know, conflicting postulates. Thus, this is a game situation, for there is postulate conflict, the postulates are in opposition. A compulsive game situation. This is identical to the voluntary game situation, except that the game is compulsive. The being feels compelled to play it, he's lost his freedom of choice in the matter. He sees the wall and has no choice but to not know it. While the game is voluntary, the being can always end it by adopting complementary postulates. For example, he stops fighting the wall and adopts a no postulate regarding its be known postulate. End of game. All games can be ended in this manner. No exceptions. If you want to stop any game you are engaged in you only have to adopt the complementary postulate to the one being held by your opponent, and the game promptly ends. He too, of course, can end it by adopting the complementary postulate to yours. You cannot force any being into a game who insists upon adopting complementary postulates to your own. Thus, a being who is free from the compulsion to play games can never be forced into a game against his choice. He'll play only as long as he wants to play, then, if you try and force him to continue, he'll merely go into a complementary postulate situation with you. There's nothing you can do about it. I mean, you can't even complain that you've lost the game, for you've clearly won it. Or have you? For you never overwhelmed him. I leave you to ponder this, for it has a large number of interesting philosophical ramifications. But what of the being in a compulsive games condition? Ah, he must go on playing. He cannot ever end the game. He's in it for keeps. He must go on, and on, and on. Just like time goes on, and on, and on in the universe. Now do you see what I mean when I say that in the absence of games, space and time cease to exist? The whole universe is kept chugging along through time and endless change by life engaged in a compulsive games condition. A being achieves nirvana when he can adopt complementary postulates with the whole universe. Then, and only then, can he leave the universe and go in search of pastures new. Until that point is reached the being is always to some degree trapped in the universe. The root out is from the compulsive playing of games, through the voluntary playing of games, to an ending of all games by the adoption of complementary postulates and so the achieving of a non-game situation, nirvana. The trap lies in the fact that the playing of games leads to the compulsive playing of games. That leads straight into every trap this universe contains. 
We only have to return to the being his freedom of choice in the playing of games and the job is done. In the overwhelm, the vanquished literally buys the pan-determined postulate of the overwhelmer. He considers this pan-determined postulate as his own. Thus, in every overwhelm we see a mis-ownership of postulate. The overwhelmed is now convinced that this is the way things are and so Ms. owns pan-determined postulate that overwhelmed him. However, as soon as he spots the Ms. ownership the overwhelm vanishes and his own postulates reappear. But until he Ms. owns the postulate the overwhelm never occurred. See it? It's very necessary, when working at the overwhelm levels of the chart, to be aware of this overwhelm and the Ms. ownership of the pan-determined postulate. These levels don't come apart otherwise. Once the being has fully bought the pan-determined postulate of his opponent in a life game, he now adopts it as his own self-determined postulate and moves to the next level upwards on the chart. In the exercises, however, once he frees the Ms. ownership at the overwhelm level he is able to move down to the next level of the chart, for these postulates are now once more available to him. If you've been following this closely, you'll have realized that at the overwhelm level we have the semblance of a no-game situation, for there is no longer any conflict between the postulates, they are indeed complementary. The only mistake on level 5 is to leave a level while it's still producing change but. And get this very clearly. If our eye needs running you don't spot that the level is still producing change. And so, you leave it. Bingo. Very soon it all collapses round you, and you are wishing that mom had given birth to anyone but you. So, when it all falls apart you just know you've left a level before you should have. So, help me, there aren't any other snags on level 5. We now need to take up the sense, or meaning, of the word must on the chart. With one exception the meaning is got to, it's a striving to make the postulate effective. The exception is at the overwhelm levels. At the point of overwhelm must means to the being overwhelmed cannot help but, it echoes the failure of his postulate in the game. So, keep this in mind as you work through the levels. We don't put up effects at level 5. We only time break effects at level 5. At level 5 we only put up postulates. The mind throws up the effects, which we time break. In this way we guarantee that we take the mind apart in the exact manner that it is available. At level 4 you experienced the phenomena of taking bits from here and bits from there off your time track, which is another way of saying your life history, while using the 8 classes of overwhelm, well, at level 5 you will see the same phenomena occurring. The mind comes apart easiest in the sequence that it is available. This is not necessarily in its temporal sequence. There is no reason why it should come apart in a temporal sequence. Trying to make it do so is merely trying to fit the mind into someone's preconceived idea of how it ought to come apart. You just have to take it apart in the sequence that it's available. You just put up the postulates, time break everything that shows up then, when putting up the postulates produces no more change, you move on to the next level. It's as simple as that. In fact, it's so simple that you'll have to resist the urge to make it more complicated. When putting up these postulates, don't be miserly. There's no shortage of them, you know? Churn out as many of them as you need. If they fade out, then create some more. Abundance is of the essence. Put them where you like. Just make sure you keep the self-postulates separated from the other's postulates. That is all. Instructions on how these postulates are put up are in the written version of TROM 2023. Early on you'll find that as one level goes null you find yourself sliding into the next level on the chart. Later on, this stops and you have to do it all yourself. This, again, is as it should be. One final point. As you move from level 4B to 5A, and from level 8B to 1A, you will feel a definite flip. This is the valence shift that exists between these levels. Early on it can be quite startling. Later you just noted in passing. Don't try and rush things at level 5. There's always an urge to race round and round the levels, rather like riding faster and faster so as to finish off before your pen runs out of ink. Resist this urge. Null each level as you go. One of the signs of overrun of a level is boredom, it's a sure sign that it's time you moved on. You'll soon learn to strike that happy medium of leaving a level, of the chart, as soon as it goes null. Always run our eye between levels. If a level is still live at session end, then pick up that same level again next session. Start your sessions with plenty of RI, then time break out the day's happenings, and off you go. You'll find quite a number of incidents that showed up at level 3 and level 4 showing up again at level 5. You're just taking more off them, that's all. You'll continue to do so until you've got the lot. Then they'll time break out completely and you'll never have them cropping up again. Indeed, very soon you'll probably never even think of them again.
Just keep going round and round that chart, level by level, time breaking as you go, and running plenty of RI, and you'll make it to Nirvana. Remember, there's no place to go after level 5. There's no level 6. And now, a final word about these practical exercises. Don't become an exercise fanatic. You won't get there any faster by making a hermit out of yourself in your urge to get there. Live your life too. Just fit your exercises into your normal life, that is always the best way. Level 5 Running of Junior Goals Note The previous section referred to as Level 5 is now known as Level 5A, which has to do with the To Know Goals package. The next section has to do with Level 5B, which is the running of other goals considered as junior goals. Junior goals are things like to help, to create, to see, to hear, to eat, and so on. They are formulated the same way as the To Know Goals package. For instance, the to help goal is expressed in all four of its legs as to help, to be helped, to not help, and to not be helped. They are mapped onto the postulate failure cycle chart the same way as the to know goals package, with the postulate conflicts and overwhelms being of the same construct, and the eight classes of overwhelm listed in the same manner. For instance, on the goal to help the overwhelms would appear as forced to help, preventing from being helped and so on. It is necessary to clearly differentiate between the rather loose term opposite and the very precise term opposition. Opposition is the exact opposing postulate, whereas opposite has a much broader use. For example, the opposite of knowing is loosely regarded as not knowing. However, the opposition postulate to to know is to be not known. This is not a matter of conjecture, but of logical necessity. Life has four basic abilities. Every purpose in life must manifest in line with one or other of these basic abilities. The totality of these manifestations regarding a purpose we call the goals package of that purpose. Thus, all possible manifestations of the goal to know are within the to know goals package. Thus, all possible games regarding a purpose are within its goals package. Thus, all possible non-games, or complementary postulate situations, regarding a purpose are within its goals package. Thus, the totality of charge, or upset, on any goal is to be found within its package. Due to the nature of conviction which is enforced knowing, the basic goals package is to know. All other goals packages are within this package. All other goals are methods of knowing, not knowing, making known or making not known. All goals packages are in exactly the same form as the to know package. All goals packages are addressed in exactly the same manner as the to know package. The oppositions in any goals package are in the same form as the oppositions in the to know package. The complementary postulates in any goals package are in the same form as the complementary postulates in the to know package. A goal can be general or specific. For example, to grow is general. To grow petunias is specific, to grow petunias in the springtime is even more specific. All specific versions of a goal are within the general version. Hence, only the general form of a goal is ever addressed, for all possible specifics are within the general. All four legs of a goals package hold each other in suspension in the mind. No goal in a goals package can be erased from the mind without also erasing the other three goals in the package. Thus, a goals package is the smallest unit that can be erased from the mind. To attempt to erase any purpose from the mind without also erasing the other three purposes in its package is merely an exercise in futility. For example, a man has a compulsion to drink. He will never be free of his compulsion to drink until he is also free of his compulsions to not drink, to be drunk, and to not be drunk. They are addressed as a set, and they erase as a set. The purpose of the goal may embrace more than one leg of the to know package. For example, you can grow something in order to be known as a grower, you can grow something in order to know what it looks like when it's grown, you can grow a hedge of shrubs in order to not know the view of the local gasworks, you can grow a hedge of shrubs in order to be not known by your neighbors. Thus, it is an error to try and draw a one-to-one -one correspondence between the legs of a goals package and the legs of the to know package. Life knows no such limitations. 
This universe is a universe of purposes, either complementary or conflicting. While viewed as such it is possible to understand it. If viewed in any other manner it forever remains a mystery. What we regard as an object in the universe only consists of purposes. It is held in existence by its own internal conflict of purposes. It is a highly compressed goals package. As the basic goals package is to know, every object in the universe can only basically consist of this package. Within this truth lies the key to vanishing unwanted universe objects. All goals packages are within the basic package to know. Why, then, may it be necessary to address other, junior, packages on the root out? Simply because a being may not clearly perceive that any given purpose in life is a method of achieving one or other of the legs of the basic package. Once he perceives this regarding a given purpose the charge on that purpose vanishes and reappears in the to-know package. While he does not perceive this the charge, or upset, remains in the junior package. The legs of a junior package must bear the same relation to each other as do the legs of the basic package. Otherwise, the package is not a true package and will never erase. For example, the complementary goal of to free is to be free not to be freed. Some care is always required in formulating the exact wording of junior packages. When a junior package is not erasing cleanly the most common fault is that the package is not a true package. This is known as cross-packaging. It is one of the deadly sins. When two or more junior packages are crossed up into one package neither of the packages will erase, and the whole mishmash just grinds on forever. The therapist who tries to resolve a man's drinking problem by addressing his infantile sex life is guilty of cross-packaging. This is why the therapy goes on forever with no relief for the patient. So, make sure that the legs of your junior packages bear exactly the same relation to each other as do the legs of the basic package. Only then will they erase. Check that the complementary postulates are indeed complementary and that the opposing postulates are exact oppositions. This can only be done on the basis of cold, hard logic. To do it any other way is to court disaster. One may have a strong gut feeling that the goal to eat is opposed by the goal to not be edible, however logic tells us that the correct opposition is to not be eaten. The difference between the package, cleanly erasing, and grinding on forever is to be found within such fine shades of meaning. Nowhere in life do you have to be more precise than in this area of composing junior goals packages. Erasure is vanishment. When a goals package has been erased from the mind it is gone. Literally. All four legs have vanished. It has not been suppressed, repressed, or any other type of pressed. It has neither been adjusted to or not adjusted to. It has gone. Even the concepts contained within the package have to be consciously created by the being before they exist. A goals package is the smallest unit that can be erased from the mind. Hence, when something erases from the mind some goals package or other has been erased. This can and does happen in general psychotherapy and accounts for the miracle cures we sometimes read about. Partial erasure of a goals package is called nulling that package. Nulling a package reduces the intensity of the compulsive games condition between the legs of the package. If a goals package can be nulled it can also be erased. Are we then free to take any purpose, formulate it into a goals package, and proceed to erase it from the mind? No. We are not free to do this for every purpose. To understand why this is so we must examine the basic urge of life in this universe. In this universe life is endeavoring to be. It is endeavoring to exist. The purest expression of this urge is contained within the to be known leg of the basic package. This is true of all life in the universe right down to the cellular, bacterial, and virus levels. Goals which further or enhance this basic urge can be formulated into goals packages and will erase. They are called life goals. Goals which oppose this basic purpose, when formulated into goals packages, will not erase. They are called non-life goals. An examination of the basic package also reveals that the goal which most furthers and enhances the to-be-known leg is the goal to know, 
the complementary goal in this package. Thus, to know most furthers and enhances life's basic urge in the universe. Thus, a life goal is defined as one which is not opposed to the to-be-known leg of the basic package and a non-life goal is defined as one which is opposed to the to-be-known leg of the basic package. Non-life goals, upon examination, will invariably be found to be part of the negative legs of life goal packages. For example, the goal to hinder is clearly totally within the to not help leg of the to help package. Non-life goals can only be erased from the mind by erasing the life goal package in which they are contained. The reason why non-life goals packages do not erase is because the goal upon which they are based is opposed to the basic urge of life in the universe, not due to some quirk in people's minds. The fact that non-life goals packages do not erase is extremely powerful evidence supporting the theory of life's basic urge in the universe. Once a life goals package has been erased all the non-life goals to be found within its negative legs will also be found to be erased. For example, once the to help goals package has been erased, the to hinder package and all similar packages to be found within the negative legs of this life goal will also be erased. The more fundamental a life goals package is, the more non-life goals are to be found within its negative legs. Thus, the to know package being the basic package, contains all possible non-life goals within its negative legs. It also contains, of course, all possible life goals within its positive legs. The general rule of therapy is to address the most fundamental life goal that will produce change in the being when addressed. From this rule is derived the rule that we always address the basic package first and stay with that package as long as it produces change. We only leave that package when it ceases to produce change in the being, and then only temporarily until it can once more be run gainfully. Life contains a near infinity of significances, and we are addressing all of them when we address the basic package. To address a junior package while the basic package can be addressed gainfully is a non-optimum use of therapy time. Knowing the nature of life's basic urge in this universe it should come as no surprise to us to learn that non-life goals packages not only never erase, but produce a steady worsening of the state of the being while erasure is being attempted. And there is no relief from this worsening. If the non-life goals package is persisted with it would eventually lead to the demise of the by now thoroughly demented and tormented being. One either does this right or it will kill you. There is no middle path. We have, within the technology of the goals package, the power to give a being either life or death. All coins have two sides. The non-life goals package is the other side of the coin called life. However, such is the power of the basic package, to know, that it will actually repair the ravages brought about by running non-life goals packages. If this were not so I would not be writing this now. But I only caught it in the nick of time. You may not be so fortunate. The to degrade goals package, when formulated and used, is one very hot non-life goals package. The whole of the to degrade package is within the negative legs of the to enhance package. This life package, when erased, also erases the to degrade package amongst others. And this erasure is achieved painlessly. Once achieved, the to degrade package can be run with impunity. It has no more charge left in it than a piece of dead codfish. I trust that you are getting the message. Such is the power of the to degrade postulate in the universe these days that the basic upset in any person's life is invariably an overt attempt to degrade them by others. It is usually in early childhood or even infancy. The incident is so abhorrent to the being that he rapidly shuts it out of mind and by adolescence it is no longer a part of his or her conscious recalls. Yet the incident continues to have a profound effect upon the being for the remainder of that lifetime and colors his physical, emotional, and intellectual approach to everything he does. The basic law of this universe states that it's only possible to know those things which have been brought into existence to be known. From this law it follows that those things which have been brought into existence to be known are by way of that fact considered knowable. This means that the universe imposes upon us a willingness to know those things we bring into existence to be known. While we function inside this law, we can play games in this universe with impunity. However, once we try and function outside of this law the universe becomes a trap. The trap is, uh, of course, our ignorance of the basic law of the universe, not something built into the universe itself. 
This means that it's quite safe to create any effect in this universe as long as one is willing to experience or know the effect one has created. Once one loses sight of this law one becomes trapped. Trapped where? Trapped within the basic to no goals package. And, of course, trapped within the universe itself. As all junior goals packages are within the basic package, they too follow the same basic law. For example, the to free package. It's not possible to be free without being willing to free others. This aspect of the basic law of the universe is called the law of the complementary postulate. It states that to adopt any postulate in a goals package while being unwilling to adopt its complementary postulate leads to entrapment in that goals package. The only entrapment this universe contains is violation of the law of the complementary postulate. Bear this law in mind as you erase goals packages. Thus, we can always measure the degree of entrapment in a goals package and the intensity of the game's condition between the legs of the package by discovering how willing the being is to adopt the complementary legs of that package. For example, the to control package. The positive complementary legs of this package are to control and to be controlled. Entrapment in this package is indicated when one of those postulates is preferred to the other. As the package erases, of course, this imbalance lessens and finally vanishes, at which time the being is equally willing to occupy any of the four legs of the package. Of course, an imbalance in the positive complementary legs of a package also produces an equal and opposite imbalance in the negative complementary legs of that package. Only life goals are erasable from the mind. None of the legs of non-life goals packages can be formulated into erasable packages. The negative legs of life goal packages, when formulated into goals packages, also will not erase. This much is obvious from first principles, but has also been verified by testing. When we violate the basic law of the universe in formulating goals packages, the packages never erase and are intensely non-therapeutic. When we try and live our lives in this universe based on non-life goals, or their negatives, we become further and further entrapped in compulsive games play, and in the universe itself. Once trapped within a goals package, whether a life or a non-life package, it is incredibly difficult to get out of this trap by the activities of one's life alone. The being moves compulsively from one leg of the package to the next, round and round, like a tennis ball bouncing inside a box. He endlessly tries to get relief from the agony that every leg eventually becomes by adopting a new leg, only to find that that leg in turn sooner or later becomes agonizing. No matter how he twists and turns and struggles, he is trapped within the goals package. There may be a relief for some by adopting the philosophy of the world's great spiritual leaders. For example, Christ's message, love thy neighbor as thyself. But for the many they are simply unable to use these roots to get out of the trap that life for them has become. They are far too enmeshed in the trap to be able to get out of the trap by changing their mode of life and thought. Their compulsive thoughts govern their behavior, their compulsive behavior governs their thoughts. They are trapped forever in the universe. This is literally true, for when the basic law governing the game of this universe was dreamed up no arrangements were made to ever bring the universe to an end. Why should they be made? Do children, left to themselves, ever put a time limit to their own playtime? The only release for the majority from the trap this universe has become for them is to methodically take apart the trap they have made for themselves. This universe was never designed as a trap. But it most certainly becomes one when one acts in it in ignorance of its basic laws. This technology is such a root out of the trap. We see, then, that the subject of traps is intimately connected to the subject of knowing. It is no accident that the basic goals package that governs life in this universe is to know. Only by resolving postulates in conflict can the being be freed from the trap the universe has become for him. This is the subject of the goals package in general, and the to know package in particular. Continue on level 5 with the to know package while it continues to produce change. Never, repeat, never leave this package for a junior package while it is still producing change. You may never have to leave it, and it will take you all the way. It is the only package that can do this. If running the to know package on level 5 never produces any change, then one of the following is happening. 1. You aren't running it properly. Check your instructions. 2. Levels 1, 2, 3, or 4 are not properly run. Go through them all once more from the beginning and complete. Then return to level 5. The basic package, when correctly run as per level 5 by a being who is ready and properly prepared to run it will always produce some change. It is usually considerable. There is no exception to this rule. No matter what goals the person is functioning on in life these goals must contain some conviction component associated with them. Conviction is enforced knowingness, and so the to-know package will mop up this charge. 
The primary error on level 5 is to abandon the to know package because it has never produced any change and go ransacking amongst junior packages like a shopper looking for bargains at a sale. None of the junior packages will aid you in the slightest until you can make the basic package run for you. The fault is not in the significance of the basic package, it lies in the fact that either you are not yet up to doing level 5, or you are not running it properly. Get the basic package running. Stay with it as long as it continues to produce change. Only when the basic package is running are junior packages runnable. To do level 5 any other way is the royal road to ending up in the hospital on bedrest. You are already playing with dynamite, so don't push your luck too far. If the to know package ceases to produce change after having produced change, then select another life goal that interests you. Interest is always the keynote that determines the selection of a junior package. It takes precedence over all other types of assessment. If a goal is of no interest to you then don't waste time addressing it, for it will not help you. Later you may become intensely interested in this goal. Then is the time to address it. Preference should be given early on to the tested list of junior life goals given in the manual. It's a very comprehensive list, and one or other of these are usually of considerable interest to most beings. This list also has the advantage of having been tested and proven out as life goals. There is really no need to ever look outside this list, but you are, of course, entirely free to do so. Having formulated your life goal package, you run the package exactly as you would run the to know package. And I mean exactly. No variations whatsoever are allowable not by me, but by the fundamental nature of this universe. And that means all the extras, like our eye, as indicated. Everything you know about running the basic package also applies to the running of junior packages. You take the whole technology and apply it to the junior package. Junior packages won't come apart if addressed in any other manner. I know, because I've tested all possible variations, and the only way junior packages come apart is when addressed in the same manner as the basic package. You enter the package at the same point, and you leave it at the same point as you do the basic package. That's it. We can see, then, that whatever the outcome of working with a junior package, the next step is always to return to the basic package and renal it. Why? Because any address to a junior package changes the breadth of your understanding of the subject of knowing, and thus permits more charge to be nulled from the basic packages. The basic package also has this quality, it has the power to straighten out any difficulties you encounter with junior packages. It is the only goals package that possesses this quality. Remember this, for it may save your life one day. This is one of the reasons why you have to null the to know package before addressing junior packages. Until the basic package has been nulled, and you realize its potential, you are adrift in a vast sea of significances called life. The to know package is always your life raft, something you can return to and get things straightened out once more. It will never fail you. Any person reading this who, without addressing levels 1, 2, 3, and 4, and thoroughly nulling them, proceeded to compose and address junior packages at level 5 without running the basic to no package first, is best advised to do so while sitting in a padded cell wearing a straight jacket. Until you get that basic package running for you, and you won't until levels 1, 2, 3, and 4 have been properly nulled, I can assure you that you are a lamb going to the slaughter when you start playing with junior packages at level 5. Yet once you have that basic package running for you, and you have nulled it as far as you possibly can, you can pick your way through the minefield of the junior packages with relative impunity, for you always have the basic package to fall back on and straighten things out once more for you. The only reason we ever run a junior package is to permit the basic package to be once more run gainfully. Dispel any ideas you may have that there are any hidden secrets of life deeply buried amongst the junior packages, only awaiting your arrival with the key to unlock them. There's nothing in any of them which isn't also in the basic package. But you don't believe this. So, you'll have to address junior packages in order to find out that it is so. If you knew this, the basic package would never go null on you, and you would never have to run a junior package. These junior significances only got into life as the result of games play. Later, they became importances in their own right. To some, they have become all of life. Once this stage is reached, the junior significance has to be addressed in its own right before the person can again realize that it always was a part of the basic package all along. After addressing a junior package your next step is always to return to the basic package. And there you stay as long as the basic package continues to produce change. If it once again goes null, then select another junior package that interests you and repeat the procedure I've indicated. Then, whatever the outcome, back you go to the basic package once more. There's no need to knock yourself about unnecessarily trying to null hot junior packages. 
There are no medals being given out for bravery in the face of the opposition legs of a goals package. If it's a mite too hot to handle right now, then leave it and return to the basic package. Just note that junior package down for future reference, that is all. Then, one day, when you are feeling all cheerful and lively, you can nip in and erase or collapse that troublesome junior package once and for all. As you progress along the route is given you will find yourself more and more working with the basic package, until eventually the merest sniff at a junior package is sufficient to erase or collapse it. After this you have to stay on the to know package simply because it's the only package that does anything for you. As this is the basic package, this is exactly how it should be. The subject of junior packages is complete in therapy when, and only when, the being is utterly certain that any purpose in life is a method of achieving one or other of the legs of the basic package. This is not merely an intellectual certainty, something which I tell you, and you believe, because my reasoning seems sound. It is something you must discover for yourself. The only way to discover this is to run junior packages. Then you will know it is true. Then, and only then, will you be free of the junior packages? When the job is done, you'll know that the to-know package is basic. The only way out of the entrapping influence of the junior packages is through them. You came in this way, and you go out in the reverse way that you came in. Then you will see them for what they are, they are methods, or systems, of knowing, brought into existence by reason of games play within the legs of the basic package. Once free of them you'll never need to address them again in therapy. From that point onwards you'll only work with the basic package, for there is nothing else left with which you can work. Undoubtedly, for many beings the erasure or collapsing of the junior packages will be the most difficult part of level 5. It's entirely a matter of how much you have convinced yourself and others that there is more to life in this universe than the subject of knowing. All the booby traps and minefields are on this subject of junior packages. Once free of them, the rest is good roads and good weather. Level 5C is the erasure of junior universes. A junior universe is a universe that is totally within the physical universe. All junior universes are within the to know basic goals package. Examples of junior universes are cats, kings, and coal heavers. Any class of identities or objects are within the class of junior universes. All junior goals packages, whether life or non-life, are within the class of junior universes. The physical universe can be divided into any concept or object and its absence. Thus, the sum of the class of cats and the class of non-cats is coextensive with the physical universe. The physical universe does not consist of cats, non-cats, and various other things. It only consists of cats and non-cats. A being playing games with cats can be bothered by cats, or be bothered by the absence of cats. As we cannot erase cats from the mind without also addressing and erasing the subject of non-cats from the mind, we are bound to address the whole junior universe of cats. It is not practical to address the subject of junior universes until the subject of junior goals packages has been resolved at step 5b. This is because the address to junior universes triggers junior goals packages which, while alive in their own right, inhibit the action of the basic package. An example will clarify this. A possible junior universe is that of a controller. Clearly, a controller controls. While the to control package is still not erased or collapsed, the junior universe of a controller will not be open to an address by the to know package. The first step is to collapse or erase the to-control package. Then, and only then, can the junior universe of a controller be successfully erased by the basic package. The junior universe is erased by the basic package by modifying the postulate failure cycle chart into postulates such as must know a controller, must not know a controller, forcing to know a controller, preventing a controller from being known, and so on. A junior universe may utilize many junior goals. Until these have been either collapsed or erased at step 5b, the junior universe is clearly not open to an address by the basic package, by formulating the postulate failure cycle chart as mentioned. Once this matter of junior goals packages has been resolved the junior universes will be found to erase cleanly when addressed as a part of the basic package. On the initial instructions regarding level 5, only postulates were to be used. No effects. This is still true of levels 5a and 5b. I was aware then that there was something inhibiting the indiscriminate use of the basic package regarding specific effects, 
but hadn't clearly isolated the factors involved. The inhibiting factor was junior goals packages. This has now been overcome at step 5b, so at step 5c we are free to use the basic package as broadly or narrowly as we desire and can add effects to the to no goals package on the postulate failure cycle chart and run level 5c according to it. The being becomes trapped in junior universes as the result of games play. It's exactly the same mechanism that entraps him in the physical universe itself. When we examine the basic package regarding an effect, we see it goes from the knowing creation of the effect down to the enforced knowing of that effect. Just how much can a being be forced to know an effect? He can become the effect. This is not the being consciously deciding to be something, but being forced to be that thing against his choice. For example, one can injudiciously play games with bodies until one is forced to be a body, and has totally lost one's freedom of choice to not be a body. This is also true of inanimate objects and other life forms. Many a compulsive fisherman ends up with a remarkable physical resemblance to his quarry and is found to be totally within the universe of a fish complete with the open and closing mouth. The being, by reason of compulsive games play, ends up unknowingly trapped within the masses and spaces with which he plays. He is now totally within a junior universe which itself is totally within the physical universe. And, as entrapment proceeds, this process continues forever. The being, now trapped within a junior universe, plays games in that universe, and in turn eventually becomes trapped in junior universes within the junior universe. The fisherman first becomes a fish then becomes a dead fish. The easiest way to become trapped in any game is to try and play it in ignorance of the rules and of one's basic nature as a player of games. It is futile to blame the universe for trapping one, for that will only trap you within it further. One became trapped by one's own ignorance. Recognize that and you can get out of the trap. Once trapped within a junior universe the being takes on the characteristics of that universe, its behavior, and so on and finds it next to impossible to recognize that he is in such a universe, or to reason outside the values and boundaries of that universe. For example, being in the universe of a material object one would find it next to impossible to conceive of life as being of a spiritual nature. It would be futile to discuss spiritual matters with such a being. However, he would be able to converse intelligently on such subjects as impacts, having pieces chipped off one, and so on. We can see, then, that entrapment in a junior universe can very easily prevent the basic package from erasing. Indeed, once the subject of junior goals packages has been resolved, it is the only thing that can prevent the erasure of the general to no package, and the regaining of full freedom of choice regarding the physical universe and its parts. Thus, step 5c is the last step, and any future improvements can only be in the selection and mode of address to this subject of junior universes. However, we have an enormous latitude within which to act at level 5c, and any future improvements to the procedure can only be marginal. The subject of valences, used in the earlier practical section, is totally within the subject of junior universes. Valences, remember, are identities assumed in games play. A junior universe is addressed by the addition of a noun representing that junior universe to each of the legs of the basic package. For example, the addition of the word cats to the basic package permits the package to be limited to the universe of all cats. This limited goals package is erased in the usual manner. In the case of cats, it would be erased from the level of force to no cats up to the level of forcing to no cats. In this universe, the particular is always within the general. For example, a particular cat named Snoozer is a junior universe within the junior universe of all cats. Within the junior universe of Snoozer the cat we find the junior universes of Snoozer's fur, Snoozer's paws, etc. If a being is in a compulsive games condition with Snoozer's paws, then by an application of level 5 see he can free himself from this junior universe. However, such a being would find it extremely difficult to erase the whole junior universe of Snoozer from his mind. For such a being to attempt to erase from their mind the class of all cats would be clearly impossible at their current level of ability. 
The correct route for them would be to first erase the universe of Snoozer's paws, then to erase the whole universe of Snoozer, and only then to embark upon the erasure of the whole class of cats. So, the general rule governing the erasure of junior universes is that if a junior universe is difficult to erase, then select a junior universe within that universe to erase first. If you proceed in this manner, you will get there. To attempt to grind away at junior universes that are not readily erasing is not only a waste of therapy time, but is to walk yourself into failure. If a junior universe is not erasing then, it is too heavy for you right now. Get inside it and erase something you can handle easily. Junior universes, like junior goals packages, are selected on the basis of interest. No other assessment is required or indicated. If the junior universe interests you it is erasable, eventually. However, you may have to get inside it first. In other words, it's possible to be interested in a junior universe that turns out to be a fair bit tougher to erase than you currently believe. Of course, you won't find this out until you try. At first on level 5c there is nearly always a tendency for the being to bite off more than he can chew, so to speak. My best advice to anyone starting level 5C is to err on the side of cautiousness in the selection of your first junior universe. If you reckon you can handle all of Snoozer the cat, then set out to erase his whiskers. There is only one other factor to mention. This is the subject of overrunning the point of erasure. Here the being misses the point of erasure and goes on trying to erase a junior universe that is already erased. Don't fall into this trap for it's very dull. When a junior universe erases you always feel it go. The whole universe has vanished from your mind. Once it's happened to you, you'll recognize it. It's a unique experience. The point of erasure is the precise moment to leave that junior universe. Don't waste time trying to find out where it's gone to. It's gone. It's erased. It no longer exists in your mind. It's a good idea to run our eye at the moment of erasure to fill the vacuum created by the vanishment of the mass. Is it possible to avoid overrun completely? Yes. There's no need for it to ever happen. The entire secret of avoiding overrun is to run sufficient RI at all times during your therapy. Then you won't miss the point of erasure and you won't overrun. Overrun only occurs in a state of depleted RI. Only then is it possible to miss the point of erasure and go sailing on trying to do the impossible, trying to erase that which is already erased. Whatever the outcome of addressing a junior universe, the next step is always to return to the general basic package and renal it. You may never have to leave it again and it will run straight on out to erasure. As with level 5b, the general basic package has the power to straighten out any difficulties you may get into while erasing junior universes. Learn to use it if and when you feel yourself being backed up into a corner while trying to erase junior universes. You can bail out at any time and repair the ravages with the basic general package. Junior goals packages, both life and non-life, are junior universes and are therefore erasable at level 5c. One merely converts the verb of the package into a noun, then formulates the limited basic package just like for any other junior universe. However, non-life goals are within life goal packages, so the fastest way to erase them is to address and erase the life goals. It's an error at level 5c to spend a lot of time on non-life goals simply because the time is better spent erasing the junior life goals. One junior life goal may contain a thousand non-life goals within its package. Erase that and you've erased all its non-life goals too. An example is the goal to eat. The noun form of the verb to eat is eating. Thus, eating becomes the subject matter of this junior universe. Erase this junior universe and you've erased all the non-life goals with the to eat package. These include such things as vomiting, poison, and a host of others. Work with the life goals at level 5c and you get there fastest. The junior universes of junior goals contain very little mass, or substance, in themselves and are entirely concepts. Therefore, you will find that you will need to run a lot of RI to erase them successfully. 
they should not be attempted early on. You do much better early on addressing junior universes that contain visible mass. Level 5C is not a substitute for Level 5B. Nevertheless, the final erasure of any junior goals package or concept from the mind is achievable at Level 5C. Indeed, it's not until Level 5C is reached that such a total erasure can even be contemplated. When we address a goals package at level 5b we are erasing or collapsing the goal as a method of achieving the legs of the basic package. At level 5c we are erasing the subject matter of the goal as something that can be known, not known, and so on. There is a difference. For example, a person may have a compulsion to eat. Only after this compulsion has been resolved is it possible to erase the whole subject of eating from the mind and to return to the being his full freedom of choice in the matter. Level 5C and the Subject of Sex Mankind has always been bothered by the subject of sex. It's essentially a bodily function for the purpose of reproducing the body which, as everyone knows, does not live forever. People also eat and breathe. Yet people are generally more bothered with this subject of sex than they are with the subjects of eating and breathing. Why? If the human body were hermaphrodite, meaning an organism with both male and female genitalia, man would have no sexual problems. His body would merely reproduce itself from time to time, and that would be an end to it. But the human body comes in two genders, male and female. Thus, there are two junior universes called masculinity and femininity. And that is where the fun and games and the problems start. The spiritual being, upon assuming a body, is placed in an either-or situation, male or female. He cannot easily be both. The full freedom of choice between male and female is one or other of the following classes, 1. Both male and female, 2. Male but not female, 3. Female but not male, 4. Neither male nor female. This exhausts all the possibilities. But the gender of his body tends to fix him in either male, but not female, or female, but not male. Being both or neither are not readily available to him. While as a male, he cannot easily understand a female, while as a female, she cannot easily understand a male, and this is the root cause of mankind's sexual difficulties. As a male, he soon starts to get opposed to females, and vice versa. Very soon his is in a terrible state on the subject, for the two genders are not by their nature in opposition to each other. We find the male desperately asserting his masculinity, while heavily suppressing any feminine characteristics in his personality, and vice versa for the female. The whole subject soon takes on the quality of a nightmare, and becomes one big unsolvable problem. And it stays this way until the being regains his full freedom of choice to occupy, at will, any one of the four classes of one, both male and female, 2. Male but not female, 3. The female but not male, 4. Neither male nor female. His body gender restricts his freedom of choice in the matter, until even his very sanity can become lost. There's nothing else involved. You cannot only be a male and not a female, or a female and not a male, and be sane on the subject of sex. Sanity lies in the direction of being able to occupy any one of the four classes at will. Only in this way can the compulsive games condition that sex becomes be resolved. The full resolution of sexual difficulties cannot be attained until level 5 is reached. Levels 1 to 4 can bring relief, but never full erasure. The steps for a full resolution at level 5 are 1. The erasing or collapsing of the two sex goals package at level 5b. 2. The erasure of the junior universes of masculinity and femininity at level 5c. The achievement of this step may, or may not, involve the erasure of the junior universes of male bodies and female bodies, and of sex as a sensation. Sex is a classic example of a compulsive games condition. The compulsive games player is always trying to convince you that you must either be for him or against him. In sex, this becomes being either a male or a female, with one opposed to the other. Yet they are not opposed, as any person who has been in love with a member of the opposite sex can tell you. 
There are many examples of this restricted freedom of choice that comes about by reason of games play to be found in life, but none of them match sex for the sheer hell that can result when that game really begins to charge up. And this is how you take it apart. Once resolved, you are only left with the sexual desires of your body. The following is an example of how a junior universe can erase from the mind. A girl has completed levels 1, 2, 3 and 4 of therapy and has nulled the basic package as far as possible at level 5A. She obviously has purposes which she considers to be independent of the basic purposes, otherwise her whole mind would have erased at level 5A, and she recalls that she's always felt uneasy about wearing a dress and decides to erase the class of dresses from her mind. She decides that a dress has two purposes. 1. To display her femininity. And 2. A modesty function of hiding her body. Addressing each of these in turn she first formulates the to display goals package which she discovers to be erasable. The concealing function of the dress is to hide which she discovers cannot be formulated into an erasable goals package but spots that it's within the to not display leg of the to display goals package. She addresses the to display package at level 5B, and it collapses after a few minutes when she realizes that to display is a method of being known, and is therefore within the to be known leg of the basic package. She now renals the basic to no package at level 5A according to the rule. The position now, she realizes, is that the class of dresses, although reduced, has not yet erased from her mind, so she hunts around for some other function of a dress. She soon spots that a dress has a sexual function when displaying her femininity, so she addresses the to sex goals package at level 5B. During the erasure of this package a childhood sexual incident involving her dress pops into view and explains her lifelong unease with wearing a dress. When the to sex package erases she returns to and renals the to no package at level 5A. She then makes address the subject matter of the to no goals package at level 5C, only to discover that it's already erased during the renulling of level 5A. She has now erased the class of dresses from her mind, and is ready to find another object or junior goals package for erasure. One day, when routinely renulling level 5A after erasing an object or junior goals package from her mind, to her great joy the basic to no goals package will itself go on through to erasure. She will then have achieved a full resolution of mind and know it.